What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Jay Hen and MG, the sports debate cast. We talk about everything sports with your host, Justin Henry and Marcus Graves. And we are joined today by NBA draft expert and top Jets fan in the nation, Ryan Hammer there on the other side. You also see him on FanDuel. Ryan, what's happening, uh, what's happening, dog? What's up, guys? Good to, good to be back. It's been a while, so I'm happy to be back on here. Yes, sir. Yeah, friend of the family, of course. We're going to be talking a little bit about the NBA, well, a lot of bit about the NBA draft. What do you think about this season, bro? The Nuggets coming out the gate. Uh, you know what I'm saying? They were the top dogs in the West. Jokic, MVP stuff early on, lost the MVP, but end up winning the finals MVP. What do you think about the Nuggets run this season? I, I mean, I like watching the Nuggets win. Like, obviously – People were two people talking about the Lakers the entire playoffs, and even after the trade deadline, the Celtics, the Bucks, and some of that. I was one of, one of those guys in the Bucks, but the Nuggets, like if you, if you look back on the whole season, like they basically cleaned through the West the entire year, entire playoffs. They handled business everywhere they needed to go. Jokic probably should have won MVP in hindsight, whether you count the playoffs or not. Like he should have won MVP, voter fatigue, he doesn't win three in a row because then people are like, well, then you got to put him in the top five all time debate and top ten all time. Well, that's what he kind of proved this this uh, this playoffs. So. Uh, cool to see him get a title and cool to see Denver win one. So I, I was happy to see that. Yeah, we, we ain't talked in a minute, Marcus. It's been a minute since we've been out talking Denver, bro. Because I was yeah, on yeah. that LA training, and yeah. obviously my guys got smoked, man. What you think about Denver, bro? Oh man, that was that was a good run for them, man. Uh, I, I know you I've was been on the heat, one. Oh yeah, I've yeah. been one. You know, in the past to be on the the Denver is a you know regular season team and. You know, put them in the kind of that Utah Jazz category the last, you know, four or five years. Um, and they, they got it done. I mean, you got to give props for props is due. Uh, Jokic proved, in my eyes, to be, you know, a top a top five to seven center of all time. Um, and, yeah, I mean, they're in a good position to, to keep this thing rolling, too. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, a lot's going to happen this offseason. It's probably some big names move, too, bro, because I got yeah. a feeling these teams aren't going to want the Nuggets repeating next year. And- yeah. Uh, I feel like these Harden names, the Kyries, the Van Vleets, like there's going to be a big name. Ryan, if you had to guess one of the guys who was going to get moved to a contender, like to a really to like the Suns or the Sixers, who you think's the guy that would like really be moved to a contender to make them a champion, like a championship contender, you know? Oof. Um, I feel like Harden, I'm not saying it's not Harden because he's either with Philly or he's going to Houston, really. I think he's a domino effect. If he leaves Philly, then like, Philly's got to go after Chris Paul. I think it's perfect. They need to go after a guy like that. Someone that's not like – they're not expecting to be a 25-10 and 10 all-star. They just need like a vet point guard who is like a quote-unquote star, whatever you want to call him. Uh, but they don't need a James Harden, I feel like. So they need a Chris Paul. I, I think that would be a good fit. Yeah. I think uh, for me, man, I think I think it's Bradley Beal. I think Bradley Beal is on the move. I think it's time, you know, Washington's – it's been, you know, however many years. Um, they're kind of just stuck in limbo of what to do. They're not making moves to get better necessarily. They're kind of just staying in that, you know, in that state of average. And I think uh, I think Bradley Beal – I think – I can see Bradley Beal going to Miami. I can see Bradley Beal making a move to uh, – even even Philly, you know, if James Harden leaves. I can see him making a move to Philly as well. So, we'll see, we'll see what happens with Bradley Beal. Yeah, state of mid that you're talking about there with the Wizards. Yeah. I, I don't like. I don't, I'm not a big fan of Bradley Beal no more. It kind of felt yeah. like his time is like. I kind of feel like the same things happened in the Dame, but he's not there yet. Where like you're in your prime, but then now that you're a free agent, now that people are like looking at you, you're not the top option anymore. You're not really a number two on a championship team. I think Beal is like the third piece on. Clippers, a Lakers, a, a Heat. Like he's not really the guy to me anymore. I'm not scared of Bradley Beal if he's on the court. He's also not going to cost like he like, his contract. He's going to be getting paid 35, 40 million a year for the next three or four years until his out of his prime. And with the new CBA and people knowing that he's available and like like you said, like he can't be the number one guy and he's going to cost that much money, like a number one option. I feel like teams are going to be super hesitant to trade for him. That's why I feel like the Wizards might honestly be stuck like holding him again, unless they can just like be like, let's just do whatever we can to get pick three from Portland or whatever here elsewhere and stuff like that. But. I feel like it's gonna be tough to like get a, get the value that they want. I think Bradley Beal's been. I think he's been injured. I think you look at you know, obviously the last two years he's played under fifty games, but two years before that he's back to back thirty point per game score. Like he's still what is he twenty eight twenty nine was Bradley Beal thirty something something yeah, in that range. Like that. Getting he's, up there. Uh, he's getting up there, but I mean that's for his the way he plays. He's not like. He's a catch and shoot. He's a you know one dribble. He's not really attacking the basket crazy like that. 
Um, especially be, he's definitely not a first option anymore, but you know, to be a second option, especially on like a heat team who needs like a, imagine, you know, a guy just that can create another shot that had Jimmy Butler, you know, gave Vincent kind of filled that Tyler hero role, um, of creating his own shot, but you know, a guy who can just, you know, knock down a shooter and can create his own shot when needed. Um, that's, that's a perfect fit in my opinion. Yeah, Bradley Beal, Tyler Hero, same, yada, yada. It's all yin and yang to me. Yeah. I feel like that's the same player, but that's neither here nor there. They were talking about Beal going to the Sacramento Kings for a minute, too. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. It'd be another yeah. score for them. They need it. Yeah. I mean, the Kings The Kings are in a good position to make a move. Um, I think they do have the, the, they have the cap, if, it, if I'm not mistaken, to make a, a max slot available, um, depending on what they do with Harrison Barnes and you know, it could free up some some space with Rashawn Holmes. Um, but I don't know if they're trying to, you know, push for a championship or if they're just kind of continue to build, you know, for the future because they're they're in like a a holding spot. You know, I yeah. think they they I think they're a couple pieces away from being a contender. Um, but I wouldn't call them like a like I don't think they need to be in a rush. Is what I'm trying to say. Feels like well, a lot of teams aren't going to be in a rush this off season because yeah. there's only a few like top top contenders. It feels like yeah. there's probably you know six to eight teams that can realistically win a championship. The rest are hoping to get the lottery balls, the ping pong uh, ping pong balls. And at the top of the list, the San Antonio Spurs did what they're supposed to do. They got the number one pick into the Victor Wembanyama sweepstakes. Ryan, for this franchise, for this organization who saw David Robinson, Tim Duncan, the prospect that is Victor Wembanyama. What can this team expect to get out of Victor Woman? Uh, who's, I mean, he's penned in as the number one pick. Let's make that very clear. Although he's not the pick yet, he is. What can this team expect for Victor Wimbanyama heading in? It sounds so like cliche, but what can't you expect from him, especially on a team that needs a big and has open role and opportunity to like figure out how to build around him and him obviously be a, their guy going forward? Uh, I mean, he's going to do everything. He's going to play the five. He's going to play the four if you need him to. He can stretch. He can shoot. He can handle like. The man, Marcus, like, yeah, you were, you, you saw him on the floor, uh, yeah. I guess, like, a little less than a year ago. I think it was October, right, yeah. before the season. He's not, like, not a human being, does all these things. It's everything that everyone says is spot on. It's not overreacting. It's not, like, a cliche at this point. Like, it sounds like it is, but it's just – it is what it is. He really can do everything on the floor, and I think that helps the Spurs be flexible with how they move forward. If they want to bring in, like, a vet, like a Chris Paul or Fred Van Vliet, and be like, hey, let's go try to make a playoff push in the next couple of years. We're not planning on winning a title – but we think we have a playoff caliber team with a vet leading us out of the backcourt. I don't see a reason not to do that. They're going to have 45, 50 million in cap space to go get that done. And they'll still have space after they sign something like that, or they can go trade up for another playmaking guard in the draft, like Anthony Black, Case and Wallace, like guys that fit their timeline more uh, and just keep building the young core. Cause their team is good. Like their team has a lot of exciting pieces on it. Keldon, Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan, like whether they keep them all together or not, Malachi Branham, Trey Jones, like good on the list. Um, but it just like his versatility allows them to do whatever they want going forward, which is awesome. They can try to win in the next three years. They can try to win in four or five years. It's going to be great. So, yeah, and I think for for the Spurs as well, you know, just speaking of the future, like, sorry, Victor Wembanyama is a guy who people are going to want to play with. So you, know, you have those free agent guys. I'm just going down the class this year. You know, Harden's, the Chris Pauls, the you know Van Fleets, like. San Antonio is now going to be an attractive, you know, attractive option to say, I want to go team up with Wembenyama. Um, Cause I mean, he's a once a, I've said it before. He's, he's who we thought Kristaps Porzingis would be. <laughs> he is the guy who we thought Kristaps would be um, even, even better than we thought Kristaps would be. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the Spurs do in the next couple of years. The unicorn, the alien, whatever you want to call yeah. him. There's, there's a lot to love with this game, right? So everybody talks about he can play like a guard. He's big. He can shoot from the outside. He does things that we haven't seen on the court before, which is always amazing. But then you start to get to the cons, right? And I think this is where a lot of people have long-term concerns when it comes to Victor Wembanyama. Is there any legitimacy concerns when it comes to the weight? Like, obviously, the frame there – He's not – we've seen him against some of the Euro competition where they'll they'll kind of body him a little bit. But then also the injuries too, right? We've seen him kind of – he's already had some injury problems heading in. And we've seen that frame, you know, not really last in the league, seven, seven, three plus, mm -hmm. under 250, under 275 pounds. Like that frame doesn't typically last. Ryan, how do you expect uh, those concerns to be – you think expect those concerns to be valid or you think they're kind of, you know, a little embellished right now? No, I, I think they're, they're kind of fished because like – the injury concerns, you can look at a guy like Dariq Whitehead, who was a top recruit coming into Duke this year. 
he's had two of the same foot surgery on, a, on an injury that you shouldn't have more than one surgery, and he's having issues. He might not even be ready for the start of next season. He hasn't been drafted yet. That's a real injury concern. It's, it's a clear injury history. He has injury-prone problems, and it's affected the style he, that he plays at, his explosiveness and his athleticism. Victor has no injury history that's of any concern, like zero at all. So people are kind of just saying that, like, oh, they're just like, oh, look at him. Like, Chet got hurt last year playing in a, in a, in a pro-am game. Like, he's, Victor's going to get hurt, too. Like, that, that is just not how it works, one. Uh, but, two, like, if people never see this stuff, if you watch Victor warm up or train or stuff like that, he does a lot of, like, uh, plyometrics and, like, really strange, like, acute exercises to make sure that these things aren't going to happen in-game and look, obviously taking care of himself long-term. Uh, I'd say more in, in a different way than people ever have. I'm not like a medical expert, but I understand the basis of that as like a former athlete. Like I know how these things work. I see what the exercises he's doing. Um, so I'm not worried about it at all. And also like he's 19 and he has shown a really good sign of toughness playing in the French league and playing in international games. Uh, and I'm, I'm not worried about bigger guys going after him. Just like I wasn't with Giannis when Giannis got into the league. I wasn't saying Giannis is going to be what Giannis has come to be. Obviously like we are with Victor, uh, but Giannis put on what? 30, 40 pounds of muscle and just absolutely started dominating everybody. So then you take Giannis and stretch him out five inches and you say the same and you're like, all right, fine. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. He, yes. Now speaking of Victor, man, like when we played him, he comes out 20. I mean, he comes out like an hour or whatever for the game. Does a 20 minute, like you said, apply a measure workout barefoot. And I was like, I can't, I was looking at him like, what the <laughs> barefoot bands doing a bunch of like, it was crazy to me, like seeing that. So like definitely the injury prevention is, you know, he's on top of that. And another thing, you know, people are talking about the weight. Like, you don't see who you got, Jokic, Embiid, Sabonis. Those are probably the only three bigs that you're worried about as a back-to-the-basket five-man. Um, and then, but, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, who's who's guarding those three? Like, who else is guarding those three anyway? Like, it's not going to be just Victor. You know what I mean? So, other than those three, I don't see another guy who, like, is going to just back Victor down like we've seen. Like, the French League and international basketball is way more physical, way more, you know, back-to-the-basket centric, big-man centric. So, um, I think – I don't think – I don't see that as being a problem. Well, we're going to find out real soon about Victor, man, because he's going to be in the league, and I'm sure everybody in the league is going to be trying to challenge his ass and, and try to see what he's really made of. So, Victor Wembanyama coming to uh, – not coming to the summer league, obviously. It looks like he might be held out of summer league, but we know he's going to be the number one pick. Marcus, I'm going to ask you first and ask Ryan. Yeah. Who's the number two pick? Tell me. <laughs> man, uh, it's tough, man. It's a toss-up. I mean, obviously, you know, I got a lot of – I've been with Scoot a lot this year and seeing, you know, what he what he's capable of. But Brandon Miller is also a great player as well. Um, I don't like the necessarily like the fit in Charlotte for Scoot, um, especially just, you know, Lomelo is so ball dominant. Obviously, you still got Terry Rozier. Who knows what they'll do with him there? Uh, but at the same time, like, it seemed, and, that, and that's what Charlotte needs is a wing, in my opinion. They need, you know, a wing scorer who can, you know, put the ball in the basket, defend, 3 and D type guy. Um, and Scoot is a guy who is going to need the ball in his hands a lot. And that is, and not, that's not a bad thing, you know, talking about him. He's going to be a great player in this league. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see. I also don't, like, in my opinion, I don't see Portland as a great fit as well, unless they trade Dane. So, you know, we've heard the talks of the Pelicans and this and that. I do see, unless Portland trades Dame, I do see somebody coming up and getting Scoot um, to be the point guard of their future. Who you got, Ryan? Obviously, you know, I, I got to listen a little bit to what Marcus says with a grain of salt. Between that, between Scoot and the Chargers, I'm like, eh, I don't know what <laughs> I believe with you, bro. So. No, I, I thought you you would think that it's, it'd be the opposite how we're going to talk because I, I think it's a no-brainer and they have to take Scoot. One, Char- mm-hmm. like, talk about the fit. So the fit, yeah, they won like 27 games last year. If you win 27 games, you have no right to draft for luxury and draft for fit and who for you sure. need. For Although, sure. Marcus, I do agree with you that like Miller 100% fits what they have positionally and rotationally i 100 agree that's that's a no-brainer but winning 27 games you can't okc has proven this where they don't need any more guards or smaller players but they took Jalen williams who's 6'5 last year and it's working out they took giddy who's 6'7 yeah. but he's a guard and it's working out uh and i just don't think they're at the luxury to do that right now at all also on top of that you see a lot like for scoot you want him to be like the pelicans is great they don't really have a true point guard cj is more of a combo a two guard so that would be a great chance for him to really like run the show there at the point um, but in terms of the team, like every good team now, every championship team, every contender has two guys, two ball yeah. dominant guys that can do everything because 
not everybody's going to be able to run the ball, run the point for 48 minutes. So I do think LaMelo and Scoot make sense because you can look into the future and be like, man, if we can just put the pieces around them together, like there's our backcourt and we are going to hopefully contend for titles in three plus years. Um, but I also think, like I said, you can't draft for fit. So looking at them in just player aspects and prospect aspects, I think Miller's awesome. He could be a future all-star. I think he's a lot of like Paul George and him. Um, but I, as a pro, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I think Scoot is a far better prospect and people are yeah. over, overlooking that now that the draft is getting closer and closer because people weren't saying this three months ago. Everyone's like, great. Victor one, Scoot two, whoever's there. Easy. And then yeah. Miller and then everyone else. And we'll figure that out when we need to. Um, so I don't really know where that's gone because these guys haven't been playing games. Like private workouts don't tell me enough. I'm not in the building, obviously. Um, but Scoot's the far better player, in my opinion, right now. So it's funny. Yeah. Smoke screens start coming out, but then it's also like I feel like these trade rumors too, right? You talk like you mentioned Marcus Dane being traded, or like the Pelicans with all the Zion stuff that's been coming in this offseason. They're talking about moving up to number two. It's like I feel like there's a lot of moving pieces with this draft, and somebody's gonna be very aggressive to go get the fit. If you felt like a team was gonna go get Scoot or Miller, which team do you think it's gonna be? Two three where where Miller goes to the to the Hornets or you think yeah. that somebody's gonna come up and get scooted too? Man, if I'm if I'm you know if Scoot's on the board at three, say Charlotte just goes Brandon Miller and Scoot's on the board at three. If I'm Orlando, I take a real look at Scoot. Um, I think you know they have the draft capital. They have two picks in the top twelve at twelve this year. Um, so that's you know gonna be enticing to Portland. Um, I really you know to pair with Paolo Bencaro for the future. I don't care if you have to get rid of you know, Cole Anthony, whoever you have to get rid of, like Scoot and Paolo will be a formidable duo for 10, 15 years. Um, so I think if, if somebody were to come up that had some, like a real chance to like build something for the future, I think Orlando would be a great team for that. Orlando, I like Orlando. I, I roll I roll with the Raptors. I think we've been rumored there. So Fred is going to leave. Mo- yeah. He's declined his option. He's probably going to go somewhere else where between Siakam and OG – and the Blazers' interest in a win-now player, especially a forward with Jeremy Grant leaving, likely leaving in free agency also. Like, I think it's a no-brainer. They are gonna, they have to blow it up. They lost Nick Nurse. They are not close to a title. It could be maybe a playoff team if they keep a lot of their vets together, but there's no reason to. They're at 13. They're 10 spots back. If it, It's a draft night thing, obviously, because you need the Hornets to pass on him to, for this to happen because I don't think the Hornets are trading out of two. Um, and I think do think they're going to take scoop, but say he, he drops to three. If I'm Toronto, I'm like, hey, like, I'm spitballing. I'll give you, I'll give you Siakam 13. You give me Simons and three, and we'll throw in an extra swap and we call it a deal or something like that. And Simons is another would be great for them also. Um, but I just think they need a point guard of the future for sure. Scotty's young, and they have young pieces. Or if they want OG, we'll we'll put a bigger package around OG to get the three. Like I, I just think it makes so much sense for them. Yeah. Raptors and the magic. I'm thinking so for Portland, do you guys think it's a is it Portland deciding the situation, or is this a Dame? Is this a Dame Lewis uh, deciding the situation? Like, what's going to happen with Portland at three? It feels like a Dame move, right? Like, yeah. sold his house. He's kind of talking a lo- <laughs> reckless about a lot of other teams: Miami, Brooklyn, players that he likes. It feels like Dame kind of holds control, and the fact that they didn't play him over the stretch at those last what ten games that it was when he wanted yeah. to play, it kind of feels like Dame's forcing the move out. And I think they're already. That's why they're looking so hard at Scoot because they mm-hmm. might already have a trade set up. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. Um, that'd be yeah, that'd be wild. That'd be yeah, wild. Was... Dame gets traded before the draft. That would be insane. Like on draft, <laughs> on draft day, Dame yeah. Lillard's trade. They would like... wait. I think they would wait until like they're not going to make a trade. They're one of the teams where I'm like, if they make a trade, it's not until the day before or the day of or during the draft because they need to try to get as much intel as they can as what's happening at two and what the market is. If they're going to trade Dame, they're going to call every single team in the NBA. And be like, hey, like. You guys want to offer a package real fast before we, you know, take this other one? So, yeah, yeah. it'll be interesting, man. Um, yeah, that'll be. I mean, <laughs> that would be, be that would be, be one crazy, of the biggest, like yeah. one is of the Dame, craziest draft like day a, things that is ever Dame, happened. Uh, is he a Kevin Durant package? Is he more of a what? What, 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 what is what does a Dame little trade package look like? Depends on the team is like. So yeah. who are we talking about? Like that. Who is going to send a, a package for him? Like the Heat, if we're talking about the Heat, they have no draft capital to do that. Yeah. You, the Blazers are going to need some major pick package, pick comp in there because one player won't get it done for any of these teams. I just don't know who's going to offer a package high enough and valuable enough for the Blazers to accept it, and also for that team to be like, all right, we can we can muster up like we have the assets to do it. Like I just don't see it. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, if we're just spitballing teams, you know, we're looking at Miami, you look at, you know, obviously you got the Lakers in there. Um, always. You always, always throw the Lakers, Lakers in there. there. <laughs> uh, there's, you know, there's been talks of the Clippers trying to make a move. Um, even the Pelicans, Pelicans, you, know, you said the Pelicans before about trading for Scoot. Like, yeah. Their team was leading the West for like half the first half of the season this yeah, year. Like yeah. they're obviously good if Zion's back and healthy. If they have Dame on their team, they could do something. Yeah, yeah. It'll be. I mean, there's so many Dame scenarios. Anyway, there. It, that's a that is a good question though, because it's like with with you know Donovan Mitchell, it's four first round draft picks. KD, there's a lot of picks plus an elite player, right? You had to give up Michael Bridges in the deal too. And it's like with Lillard, we know he's getting older. It probably would be something to the KD scale, but it doesn't feel like it would be as much, you know? Yeah. I also think it's. I think everything's a little skewed. I think I think the Suns panicked a little bit in that deal. Yeah, I mean, giving up Cam Johnson, Mikael right. Bridges. Those are the guys uh, they needed. Yeah. They needed yeah. those guys to contend for. They need the connectors. They need the role yeah. players. Like you're never gonna. I hated that so much. Oh yeah, God. and I think I think even though you look at like last year's off season, I think teams are gonna be more cautious because you look at the Rudy Gobert yeah. deal and you know how much they gave up. Um, and you saw you see how <laughs> that's, that's working out. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell's a good player. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's worth mortgage in the future over because I don't think Cleveland's, I still don't think Cleveland's close to being a championship contender. Um, so, I mean, I think you'll see this year, I don't know if it'll be as high draft capital, um, but I think it'll be more player-centric and more, you know, looking like two to three first-round picks rather than, you know, four to five. Outside of those top three guys, right, we talked about, is there anybody else in the top 10 that you feel like some team is going to come up for, right? Like a team like the Thunder that just has a ton of picks or maybe somebody with a bunch of draft capital. Is there anybody that's kind of going under the radar that a team might be like, you know what, we need to come up and snatch and get him before uh, before he falls too far? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of the forwards and wings are going to go. So, like, we talk about the Thompson Twins, talk about Cam Whitmore, Taylor Hendricks, Jarrett Walker. A lot of those, like, physical players that are on the wing will go because of their size, versatility, able to do everything. I think the guards are where they drop. Say, so we're talking about like say the Magic go forward and the Pistons do also. The, I know the Pacers are, and then the Wizards take a guard, but then there's two or three more left on the board in the lottery. It's like Anthony Black, Jalen Huchifino, Casey Wallace. If two of those guys go in the top ten and one of them slips outside, I could definitely see teams like I know Atlanta is has been talking about moving up. Utah has a lot of picks to move up. Uh, the Rockets have been talking about trading 20. The Nets have 21 and 22 and can go get a guard like that that they really need for the future. Uh, I could see teams like that dra- or drafting, excuse me, trading up into like the late lottery, maybe back end of the top 10, depending on those guys. If Anthony Black falls, Garrett passed. If the Wizards pass on him for whatever reason, if he's on the board, someone's going to trade up to nine or the or the, the Jazz will be like, we are not passing on him. But yeah. I can see a guy like that getting traded up for. I mean, I look at, I look at a team like Indiana – um five picks you know four picks in the first 32 you got i mean you got pick seven why not why not move up and go get another top 15 guy you know you're you're looking to build obviously young um tyrese halberton you know matherin you know guys like that like why not get two more first round picks there's no reason for them to draft five guys in this draft yeah. <laughs> like there's no reason for that um it's, it's all about getting you know some good talent on your team you can go ahead and pick, you know, two second round guys and throw them in the G League or whatever you want to do. But I mean, if you're looking to build, and this is the they got five picks to make some noise. I think I think you got to trade, you know, two or two or three of those at least and try and move back up in the lottery. Yeah. I feel like the Pacers were a team that kind of tanked too towards the end of the year. It felt like yeah. they were cruising like the bottom of the East there in the playoff bracket. But then, like once once the end of the, the end of the season hit, it felt like they just kind of tailed off almost mm-hmm. intentionally. What about uh what about a player who could fall on draft day? Is there anybody who you're like, ah, I can see this dude slipping pretty far in draft day, like compared to where he's going in mock drafts right now? Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I, I know there's a bunch of guys like I'm not gonna like spit out intel from like uncertain players, but like things always shake up on draft night. I know Bryce Sensabaugh is someone that people love at Ohio State, scoring wing, like as pure as you can find it as a scoring game, super efficient. He's challenged on the defensive side and athletically like going vertical at least. And I think those are real concerns. Uh, he didn't get a green room invite, which is the ni- top 19 prospects voted on by teams. doesn't mean he can't go in the lottery or top 19, but it means he's more than likely going to be on the back end of the top 20 plus. Uh, I think there's a chance he slides to like the back end of the first, maybe even right at the beginning of the second. Uh, but he's a guy that people have like lottery grades on that I think could definitely fall. And Dariq Whitehead because of those injuries. And I think, 
like AJ Griffin last year slid out of the lottery, and like I was ready for that because of his injuries has had changed his game. And AJ Griffin's awesome. And I'm a Hawks fan. I love having AJ Griffin on the team. But he he was drafted in the spot he was meant to get drafted, and people were way too high on him last year. And I think Derek White has the same kind of similar kind of guy where injuries have held him back athletically and physically, but he's a great shooter. He's young. He's got a lot of upside. He could get to that point if he kind of fully recovers from those things. But teams will see a lot of other wings and combo guards that can do just as much as he can or similar upside at least. And they'll, they'll prioritize those guys like Max Lewis, like Brandon Pazimski, the guys who have played a few years in college and have proven themselves year over year. Uh, and he might slip towards like the back sim- – similar range as Bryce Sensible on the back end of the first. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at guys. I think in the first, in like the mid lottery, there's a lot of like potential guys. Like there's a lot of like, I want to say, I'm not going to, I'm going to say like projects. You know, you look at Balako, Bali, Gigi Jackson, even, you know, like a guy like my guy, Leonard Miller, Ignite, like the guys who are going to need some work. So I think it's, you know, our teams in that lottery trying to make a win now move. Are they trying to, you know, build for the future? Um, that's, that's something that'll be, that'll be interesting to look at. Uh, you know, at the at the back end of the lottery, the GG thing. I'm, I'm I. Their teams are gonna drop or let him drop, and they're gonna yeah. They're gonna, re- they're gonna regret that so fast. It's gonna be it's unbelievable. Like uh huh. He, he's he's gonna be the youngest player in the NBA next year when he gets drafted. He's gonna be 18 and a half on draft night. So he you should be going to anymore. senior. He should be going to senior prom tomorrow night, not yeah. like getting ready to get drafted in a week because um, of his reclass. But man, his his game is so pure. His creation and his size is so so natural and so. It just creates so much upside for me and so much talent that in the right, like if the Heat were to swing on him at 18, uh, he'd be an all star in five years. It'd be, it'd, be, yeah. it'd be great. But I think teams will let him slip, sadly. So, yeah. Yo, Who's Ryan, that? I want to ask you this real quick, Ryan, before you get into that, Marcus. I want to ask you this because I've been going to these AAU tournaments, right? My son's 12. And I see all these guys now, and there with COVID, there was an additional year, right, of eligibility for some of these guys. So yep. you'll see in 12 you, you'll see 13 year olds, obviously, but now even some 14 year olds in uh, in the 12 you, right? So they'll play a year or two up. Is that going to be the nature of how things are? Like I don't know if anybody in this class was affected by that, but is that going to be how things are? We're starting to look at guys to you know a year or two removed from their original class. Yeah. Um... And honestly, it can go both ways. Like you can see guys that in the draft perspective that are fifth year, sixth year, sometimes seventh year players. Like obviously those guys usually don't get drafted because their age and upside. But a lot of the guys that are fifth years are like coming back to college and they're hindering the freshman class coming in. So college basketball coaches are prioritizing experience through NIL and the transfer portal with guys that are playing their fifth and sixth years because those guys are going to give you, you know what they're giving you. You don't know what the freshman guys are giving you a lot. Um, so I think it affects those guys more than anything else. This freshman class that is – they're going to be uh, – they're like 19 years old. They just finished their one year – one and done in college was exceptionally talented overall, like a top 20, 30 guys. So it's less affected here. Um, but I think next year is a year you see it like that. But like you said, like you see it a lot where younger guys too are just like stepping up when they're ready. They're Gigi Jackson. Like Elliot Cadeau is going to North Carolina a year earlier than he's supposed to this upcoming season just because he's like, I'm ready and I need to make the jump now while I have the chance – because that extra year under his belt in college might actually help him out. So, yeah. And no, uh, speaking of that, like you know, talking about guys, you know what you're gonna get out of them. Second round guys, you always get one or two that you know flourish. Uh, you know, you look at you know the Draymonds, Jalen Brunson. Uh, last year, you know, Andrew Nemar had a great year. Who's a guy that you can see? You know, who's more maybe an older guy or a guy who is just you know falling. Uh, who's a guy you can see, you know, having a, a good rookie season in the second round? There's always second round. There's always yeah. second round steals. One for sure. I have a first round, a high, like a good first round grade on Marcus Sasser. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, there is just no way you can tell me that Marcus Sasser isn't in an NBA rotation playing at least 10, 15 minutes a game in whatever months the next season starts. Like in October, he is such an elite defender. He's such an elite shooter. He's so quick. His step back is great. Like, he just does so many simple things that a bunch of other guys do. His hustle stats playing at Houston, he is just gritty. He's down for everything. Uh, he's confident in his game too. So he's a guy I think is worth a top 20 to 25 pick for a contender. There's not a, a lot of contenders in the back end of the first like there normally is because of a lot of traded picks this year. Um, but if I'm like the Clippers are at 30, if he's in the board, take him up, call it a day. Uh, yeah. Jaime Hawkins is probably going to be a similar range like that. But – Guy that's definitely going to go in the second – or not definitely, but Jordan Walsh also, where we're talking about role players. Like, I was saying this about Christian Brown last year. 
I literally posted a clip on Twitter yesterday of my old YouTube video from last year. It said like, oh, like he's – people don't think he's that he doesn't have a lot of upside, but everything he does is going to be towards winning impact for a team and probably a championship contender, and he'll win a title in a few years, and then a kid wins a title. So I think Jordan Walsh offers a similar like high-level elite role player upside, which is not no problem at all. He's going to be great. Yeah. So. No, I, I think that's – I think the teams are – they get too caught up in the upside like – I mean, like you said, like that was the guy I was thinking of. Like Marcus Sasser is a first round pick. Nobody can tell me anything. <laughs> Dude is a first round pick. He's elite. Um, I, I know he had an injury last year. It kind of kept him out, but like this dude is no by far a first round pick. I don't care who you have, twenty through thirty. Like I think people get sometimes too caught up in the upside. And like, I mean, I get it. You know, you can sometimes you swing and you hit hit a home run. But I mean, if like you said, if you're a team who's who's looking to contend. Like, he's, he's a guy you want on your team for sure, in my opinion. And the further you go in the draft, the late first, early second, the less chance you have of getting all-stars and those high upside guys panning out. Yeah. Um, so, like, it, like Jordan Walsh talking about Marcus Sasser, Andre Jackson, like a lot of guys like Olivier Maxence Prosper who do, like, a lot of the things beyond the statue and the non-flashy things really well. And then yeah. you're like, oh, wow, like, that guy went pick 38. Like, why didn't we consider him at 20 and 25? Yeah. Because he's playing 20 minutes a game in year two. So, yeah. Outside of Wimby, obviously Wimby being the international guy, is there any other international guys we should be like? Obviously, Jokic winning MVP, finals MVP. We know the international game is ready. Like, is there anybody else that's coming in that we should be keeping our eyes on? Not like MVP level, um, <laughs> but Marcus mentioned him before, Bilal Koulibaly. He actually played play with Victor this entire year yep. at Mets 92 in France. He's been like a massive riser to the process. Now, uh, it definitely is a part that they've been playing. They're still playing Mets 92. So, like, they're playing this whole time. So, like, that is a is a is is an advantage for him. No one else is playing except for them. Um, but he has got some wild upside. He's young. He's super lengthy, like 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, with like a 7'3 wingspan, a lot of natural fluidity and athleticism. So, he's one of those guys that, like, needs to be in the right system and needs to be, like, developed properly in the right organization. But if he is – uh, he could be someone that like is pretty scary down the road. Crazy about him is like no disrespect to him. I think he's a great player. I watched one of their games recently, but when we played him, he was terrible. No, yeah, terrible. Awesome. Like no, seriously. And they're they like we're in the middle of the season. They're like, yeah, they, remember that guy from uh, Miss Ninety Two? Not Victor, <laughs> the other guy. And I like was like, I don't, I don't know who you're talking about. And I show they showed me a video, and I was like, him? <laughs> like I was like actually shocked. And. No, yeah. Oh, I mean, lost him. But he's yeah. no, he's right though. He like Bilal was he playing at a miserable level. His statistical production of the year was like five points a game. Some pretty poor shooting splits for most of the year, but it just progressively got better and better and better as the year went on. And as he does through workouts and things like that, you can see the the fluidity and athleticism and the tools is so important with a guy like that. Um, so he could go as high as like honestly like nine to twelve, but he'll probably be in the back end of the lottery. But Marcus, we are, you're right. Like he is production Bro, terrible. Yeah, so a lot of really bad splits. It. You're good. No. Yeah. No, but I, I was I watched the game like two weeks ago, and he is like a legit hoop. Like he's one of their best players. <laughs> and I great. was like, I was genuinely shocked, honestly. Has he just not been playing? Like, is he a newer I, player? He was playing for the 16s for yeah. a while, like on he's the or under 18. Sorry, for a long, long time, uh, yeah. for most of the year, and then he kind of just like slowly eased into it. Yeah. So CD Sissoko, who's on G League Ignite. Um, from France, he was like him and Kuba are really good friends. He was saying like they kind of just brought him when when they played us because they just wanted him to get some experience. Mm -hmm. um, and like the feeling I got from CD was that like he didn't even like he was expected to go to next year's draft, yeah, twenty twenty four. And then the way he just took the jump this year like has just vaults them into like a he's gonna be he's gonna be a lottery pick. Yeah, and like I gotta, I gotta get problems. Like the kid's been balling, man. Like I watched one of their games, and I was genuinely like surprised how how well he's been playing. Putting in the work, man. Yeah, he'll be, one, he'll be that guy on draft night. We're like, I'm from New Jersey in like New York area. So when Frank Nozilakina Nilt got drafted, people were like, "Who in the world is this guy?" Even Kristaps, like yeah. casual fans, were like, "Who, who do we just take?" People, if I'm looking at teams like the Pelicans or like the Mavs, like the Mavs won't do it. But like if they're like Bilal Cool Bali, I pick number ten. Mavs fans are gonna be like. Who is this kid? Like, what yeah. are we doing here? They won't take him, but it's it's he's that kind of player. But he could be really, really good. Like, he's got some wicked tools. So, yeah. Right. Any more draft thoughts for we? Uh, because I we got we got to talk some football too, y'all. Man, 
No, no, no. I'm good on the drafts. Okay, I could do this, do this for hours. For days, so <laughs> good, man. Of course, that's yeah. what you do. So June 22nd, NBA draft. Appreciate it, Ryan. Throwing his expertise on it, Marcus, his expertise on it. But I'm going to put my football expertise on this next segment. We got to talk <laughs> Jets, bro. Aaron Rodgers on the Jets now. Uh, it's a new a new day for our Jets fan, Ryan Hammer over there, bro. How you feeling about the Jets? It's raps. It's raps. Man, nah, nah, I'm, I'm, ex- I'm just excited. I was telling you before the show, like, yeah, I love the offseason and the hype we have. And I almost don't want the season to start because I don't want any chance. Of this. There's no, like, the only successful season is if we're, like, in the conference championship. We're not successful, like, yeah. in terms of I'm like, holy crap, like, I did not expect this, like, surprising in a good way. Um, I'm just worried that, like, some, he gets hurt or Aaron Rodgers gets hurt or something bad happens where we just aren't as good as we're supposed to be. But – Man, the team is so good. There's so many young pieces. The defense is so good that, like, we have a really high floor because we had no quarterback play last year, and we were still a seven, eight-win team. Um, so I'm really, really excited, and we have a lot of, like, I can't think of a true weak spot in our team right now as long as Mekhi Beckton is actually fit to play. So I feel like, you know, I like the Jets, man. The Jets are one of those teams where I, I kind of liked them more before A-Raj joined, and I feel like now the bar is set so high. It's like if, if you guys don't win a Super Bowl, it's almost like a lost season, right, in the next three years. So I know for Jets fans, it's like you just want to have a consistent quarterback, some consistency at the position. Yeah. But to me, I'm not all excited about it, man. But so- seeing Sauce, uh, excited about it. Garrett Wilson, you know, in fantasy, Garrett Wilson's a guy I'm targeting now. Because I feel like Sky you, is the limit for that kid. Are you not worried, like, about the Randall Cobb, Alan Lazar, Corey Davis, Michael Carter, Brees Hall? Are you not worried at all? Like, I'm a, I, I love Garrett Wilson. He's going to have a great year no matter what. Because he is our dude, and he's going to be on the field getting his number one reps, and then everyone else will file in behind him, I guess. But like, Rogers likes his guys, and I feel like, are you are you worried at all about that? No, so I'm not worried. I'm worried about a yardage wise, right? Like, okay. I don't think I don't think Garrett Wilson's going to be this 1500 yard, 1800 yard wide receiver, the wide receiver one in fantasy. But what I do think is, I think he's going to have like 15 touchdowns. Because once Rogers locks yeah. in on his touchdown, his red zone <laughs> yeah. guy, that's where that's where you find a win. So. If that is his guy, because Lazar's not his touchdown guy, Randall Cobb's not his touchdown guy, Miko Hardman's not going to be his touchdown guy, and the Jets don't really have that good at tight ends, you go – Garrett Wilson's the red zone threat now. So where I look at his value is most mostly tied to touchdowns at the back end of, like, the top ten wide receivers. So, But I am – the one player I'm kind of concerned about is Brees Hall. Yeah. Brees I'm concerned about because every – you know, the ACL obviously came back from that, but it, it feels like it's a year too early. Yeah, I, like the health stuff, I'm more like, I don't know, we don't know what we don't know. Like, if he's good, he's good. If he's not, he's not. But, like, he was splitting with Carter a bunch last year, but he was getting his, like, he was getting his before he got injured, obviously. But, like, with our passing game going to be much more developed and much more extensive this year with more receivers, more options, and obviously a new quarterback. Um, it, I'm concerned a little bit fantasy-wise. I think it's better for Brees as, like, a player and his, especially his health. Uh, Cause he'll be eased into things and he won't be relied on as much. Cause last year when he was, when he was in that like four game heater, it was like, we, we just got to feed Brees. Otherwise we are going to lose this game or we're going to lose this game. Yeah. Uh, so he's really talented. He's awesome. I think lower the usage, higher the efficiency and you'll be less worried about his health and stuff like that. So I think it'll be better for him, but I do agree with you in fantasy. He's probably going like third round ish right now is my guess. Right. Where I'm like, yeah, he's not third like round. him, ETN, like Ramon, like Ramondre. It's like a big pool of those guys. It's almost a dead zone. That's where the dead zone starts, I guess. Right. Where you're like, what right. do I do? So. Tony Pollard, like Tony Pollard esque, like the, the question marks after like Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry. B. Right. John. What do you do? Yeah. Yeah. So it's tough because especially with a guy like Brees, I, I, I like the talent and you know, he has that like, Saquon level type of ceiling, right. but just not this season. So I think in in yeah. dynasty, like if you ever played dynasty leagues or anybody watching oh, playing dynasty, yeah. like that's a player you could target for the low, especially if he has a couple down weeks earlier on in the season. Who's your guy? Like who's outside of Jets players? Who's your guy fantasy wise? Like you have anybody that you're like, oh, I feel like their situation's a lot better than people think it is. Um, I think there's a lot. Of, you can go down a whole list, like. I feel like it's usually a lot of those receivers from like the not in receiver rank, but in general rank from like the 50 to like hundred range. It's a wide range. Right. Um, but I think that's a decent, decent range to like target guys. I think Elijah Moore is actually like no jets. Oh my at all. God. Here we go again. I, no, 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 no. Cause I think the Brown stack is actually not a bad stack at all this year, especially like best ball formats and stuff like that. And now that Deshaun's had time to settle in, I actually think Deshaun is going to take like a huge step toward back toward what he used to be before he, uh, Last couple of years, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> I think Elijah could be Elijah and Amari Cooper also, to be completely honest, because Amari could be like 
we've seen what Amari Cooper can do. We yeah. know how talented he is. Like he could go absolutely crazy. But I think there's a lot of benefit for Elijah also because they don't have a ton of options still, even though they still have a lot of their guys that they kept year over year. Um, but I think Cooper could go absolutely crazy this year. I don't know. See, I, I like the Cooper take because I do think that the Browns pass the ball a lot more. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to like, I'm 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 not a big Elijah Moore fan. So let me <laughs> let me put my you know my opinion into the side because I'm not a big like I kind of think he's mid. I'm not gonna lie. Like if DBJ is there, David and Joku. Yeah. I just feel like they got better weapons. Yeah, but I'll give one more because I think I don't know if you're gonna like it actually or not. Uh, <laughs> it's is because I don't know. I have no confidence in their pass game. No matter who's playing quarterback, is Traylon Burks because there's no one else there. Yeah. Especially in dynasty formats, like I've been trying to trade for him in my dynasty league forever, and like I've been trying to trade Debo to go get him, and the guy's like, nope. And I'm like, I don't know what you want me to do at this point. So, um, but Burks, I think like he, we know how talented he is. He, he's had a couple of good games last year, but in and out of injury. Um, but like someone, the, every NFL team has to pass the ball. They have to have someone that's a good receiver, like relative in some kind of relative level. Um, so I think Traylon Burks could do well. I like Burks a lot. So, and I think that the opportunity is there, especially if Tannehill's a starter. I think everybody's expecting Will Levis or Malik Willis. Obviously, is not a thing anymore. But like, Will Levis isn't going to go make Traylon Burks a superstar this year. Right. But Tannehill could. We saw what he did with AJ Brown earlier on before he went to the Eagles. And mm-hmm. I think there's a, a viable spot for him to be a wide receiver three in that offense. So. I like Burks a lot, man. I feel like the kid's good. And so I got more sleepers coming up. Hold on. We might got Marcus back. He said he was doing some technical difficulties there with Marcus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and now yeah. he's back. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Wow, bro. Now he's back. A little intermission for Marcus there. Man, I don't know what's going on. I'm freaking – my whole power, like, flickered out for a second. Oh, shit. So, uh, yeah. We were talking so. Jets for a little bit, and then we are going over, like, fantasy football superstars. And he said Elijah Moore is going to be his first-round pick. Ah, uh, <laughs> I just say he's decent guy, dude. He he's probably going well, like thirteenth, twelfth round. Not maybe that yeah. that late, but like he's close to. I just think the Browns have like more, a lot more to like this year. So, who'd you Man. sleep with, Marcus? You gotta drop it, drop it now before before Sleeper all the names start coming out. Fantasy. Oh man, you know actually, I don't and know you can't say Quentin Johnston. Yeah, I no, love Quentin Johnston. I love Quentin Johnston. Oh, it's another rookie though. I don't know if it's a sleeper necessarily, but I love Jordan Addison. Um, I think Jordan Addison, I think he's – obviously, we've seen Adam Thielen have big years next to Justin Jefferson and uh, – oh, I mean, and Stephon Diggs in the past. But, you know, Kirk Kirk loves that second and that second receiver as well. Um, so, I see I see Jordan Addison having, having a pretty solid year. I don't know if that's necessarily a sleeper, but we'll see. I got a little sleeper. He's not really a sleeper because he's been great in the past. He hasn't been great recently, and he's been injured recently. My guy, Odell. I think Odell, mm. a lot of people are pinning him for, like, 500, 600 yards. I think he has, like, a 1,000-yard season, eight touchdowns. Like, it seems in the realm of possibilities that the Ravens open things up. So They have to, right? Like, I was going to say they met Dobbins, where, like, Dobbins has to be used completely different than he ever has because he's super talented. But, like, are they going to do that with the running backs? They're going to – Lamar says he's going to pass the shit out of the ball this year. Like, you know? So, I don't know. Lamar Jackson, the first 4,000, 1,000 quarterback ever in history. That's what I'm calling that shit right now. <laughs> Jeez. We'll see. We'll see what happens. What, right, what, what, was the, what was the Jets talk about? Where, where, where are oh. we going this year, Ryan? Super Bowl? Uh, I, that'd be great. I'd be, I just okay. want to go to the – I'll be honest. I'll say one last thing about them. I just want to go to the playoffs. Like, I just want to okay. I just want to go to the playoffs. I just want to be at a playoff game. Like, you can't be realistic on here, bro. You got to be All like right, that. We go, we go like to the bowl. We go to the bowl. <laughs> Me with the Niners and Marcus with the Chargers. I'm like, hey, we went in the Super Bowl. It's going to be Niners in the NFC Championship. It don't matter who we play. We're going to win. And then Chargers and Jets in the AFC Championship. I'm writing it down now. <laughs> hey, I, I got Justin Herbert memorabilia on the freaking oh, – the whole wall over here. Massive. I, yeah. I'm like low-key a, a secondary Chargers fan, so I'm with that. <laughs> Yo, he's, he's kind of a sleeper. Yeah. yeah. Caleb Moore like opened it up this year. Yeah, I think Herbert's – I think Herbert's a guy we had sure. in the top three yeah, like sure. last year. He's going, what, eight, ninth, tenth quarterback off the board now. That's crazy to me. Yeah. yeah. I, I got to ask you guys one question, actually, a fantasy question, because my keeper league, we do like a – you can keep guys based on where you drafted them last year. So I'll give you three options. you got to choose two. All of them would be like eighth-round keepers. In regular 12 – one quarterback, 12 team, you get Justin Fields, Calvin Ridley, and Damian Pierce. They're all going like the same ADP right now. And I'm like, <laughs> don't, damn, like <laughs> don't ask Justin this question. Don't ask me. I I feel, oh, you hate – Wait, I forgot you hate you. You're Damian Pierce, like you hate. He's a Damian right? Pierce, Pierce hater. Pierce hater. Yeah. You're really, you're really in Fields. Um, I like Fields and I like Pierce. Yeah, 
Just like yeah. not Pierce. Yeah, Ridley. No, Pierce won't be the starter next year. He might not be the starter of the entire season this year. Oh what my god! What? Devin Singletary there? What you talking stop, about? Brand dude, new, brand new offense. <laughs> I'm I'm Please going to TikTok stop. right now. I'm unloading on fantasy TikTok. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Please. Hey, stop I'm telling it. you, like Damian Pierce, he's good, but he's not like a long term back. He just have he don't have draft capital. He don't really have the talent like hand wise, blocking wise. He just. He's a hard one. Right. He's got Singletary. He's going to hit in the backfield every every single time he touches the ball. Every single time he touches the ball, hit in the backfield, and he has to make something on nothing. I mean, he can drag a guy an extra half yard. I, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All right, so I'll keep it Fields and Ridley. Uh, who knows? We'll see. Well, Ridley, I got question marks about Ridley, too, but I think Ridley, at least at receiver, he's a young. He's still a young guy tied to Trevor Lawrence there. And even if he's even if he's slow to get back this year, I think there's a long term thing with with Calvin Ridley. So even if he's like a thousand and, and six this year, I think there's a pedestal for him to continue to grow. Yeah. Whereas like running backs in general, you don't want you don't want you don't want to be tied to running backs for a long period of time. You keep Justin Fields; he's a forty point QB, better offense around him this year. I would go Fields and Ridley, and it's not just because of the hate. For no, that was Pierce. that was fair. That was fair because if I keep him as an eighth rounder this year, he'll be a seventh next year, and six, and so on. So, like, that's actually, you know what? There we go. We didn't get just like Damian Pierce can't run the ball. We get <laughs> we had we had the Damian Pierce. The name came out. The whole trajectory of the I conversation forgot. changed. I forgot, dude. I was like, wait a minute. I remember this on TikTok. I'm not doing this. Oh, yeah, and it's not hate. Like, I think people get that so confused. It's not really hate for Damian Pierce. It's just like. He don't really add value fantasy wise. He's a hard like unless he gets twenty carries in every red zone touch from a team that doesn't score a lot of touchdowns, he's not really get a, a true fantasy value in my opinion. Whereas Calvin really t- tied to a good offense. Uh, Justin Fields has the rushing floor. He's going to be the highest probably twelve hundred yard rusher again this year. Like I just feel like Damian Pierce. Most if you have a running back in a PPR league, you want a guy that catches the rock or can score yeah. touchdowns. And Damian Pierce is going to struggle to do both. It's fair. It's fair. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it ain't just hate based. Ever. All right. And just hate based. <laughs> Yo, anything, any party thoughts before we get off, fellas? All good, brother. Sorry right, about man. the Wi-Fi. As always, dog. I appreciate you guys having me on, as always. Yes, it's always, always good times. Yeah, we're going to do more fantasy talk, man. We always get you on here just for the NBA. It's like, fuck that. We got to get you on here for everything, bro. So. We got to get you on here in two weeks. We got to talk draft recap. I'm, yeah, draft I'm, I'm recap here. I'm here. Show. Yeah, as I'm I just here. say, no more draft. You coming back for the draft talk afterwards? Yeah, too. facts. Yeah, me and Marcus, we have to skip out on summer league this year. Now that Victor's not playing, I'm not going. <laughs> I, I refuse to go. Oh my god! Oh, you saw it's not fair though. You're on the floor with him already, so you're like, oh, it's cool. I'll just go. Whatever. Yeah. Like, I need to see this man in. He, he might be there though. You never know. Yeah. Yo, I was gonna, I was gonna go to uh, California Classic. The Spurs are trying to, play, you know, they were supposed to play there, and he's not gonna play. The ticket sales, the tickets were like two hundred dollars each. Yeah. For, summer for summer league, league bro, oh lower level summer league, two hundred dollars. You'll see, you'll see a uh, Scoot or Brandon Miller there. Yeah, there you go. Charlotte's going only, too, right? Yeah, I'd only, I'd only go for Scoot. I wouldn't go for no Brandon Miller, bro. Yeah, we'll see what happens, man. <laughs> I go for Scoot though. Damian yeah. Pierce, Brandon Miller, got it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know nothing about Brandon Miller. So he, <laughs> he might be my favorite player in two years. <laughs> All right, for myself, for Ryan Hammer, Marcus Graves. That does it for this episode of Jay Hen and MG. Be sure you guys like, subscribe, share, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace out. Yes, sir.